thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good, okay. We are all of us in this room by inclination, and some of us are by profession intellectuals. As such, there is a continual temptation for us to pay a greater regard to the power of ideas than is actually the case. We are intellectually We have been intellectually convinced of the power of libertarian or conservative ideas. And our intellectual conviction has created a passionate moral and spiritual conviction of the truth of those ideas. And there is a temptation for us to regard those people who do not share our conviction as either bad or stupid. In the case of many intellectuals, that is a fair inference. But when it comes to the great mass of ordinary people, I think it is unfair. Most ordinary people are cleverer than I am, and many of them are cleverer than you are. The difference between them and us is that they don't care about ideas. They care about ideas in the way that I care about colour schemes. I am as capable as anybody of looking at a particular colour scheme and saying, well, that doesn't seem to work very well, or that's rather nice. But when people start talking about the harmony of shades and which colours go with which, my eyes glaze over. I'm not interested. Go away and do it, leave it to the experts. And that is how most people regard ideas. They're not interested. They have better things to do with their lives. And so, if we want to win the battle of ideas, no, no, if we want a complete and overpowering victory in the battle of ideas, a victory which persists generation and indeed century after century, we need perhaps to look at something more powerful as a stabilizing force than the power of mere abstract ideas. And what I want to talk about is a case study of such a stabilization of liberal or libertarian or conservative values. I will talk about England as it's the subject that I know best. Now for Various historical reasons, which it would take far too long to explain, and which would take me far outside my remit, I would simply say that England was uniquely fortunate. It was the only country in Europe which preserved the outlines, and indeed the details, of a limited medieval constitution into the rising commercial civilization of the 17th century. England is the home of liberal or libertarian or conservative ideas. All modern libertarianism is, in a sense, a codification of English political and intellectual experience. That is true. It is perhaps a somewhat exaggerated claim, but I would insist that it is in its outline the truth. Now, you might think that the English liberal tradition was created by John Locke, and David Hume, and Adam Smith, and Thomas Babington McCall, and even though there are some uh, criticisms made of them, by John Stuart Mill. What I would say is that although these great thinkers contributed much to the English liberal tradition, they have not created it. They are at least as much an effect of that tradition as a cause of it. The reason why England was and remained a free country for so many centuries had very little to do with the power of autonomous ideas. If you think of political philosophy in the late 17th century, you think John Locke, yes. John Locke speaks directly to us. John Locke was an abstract philosopher. Oh, his second treatise on civil government was uh, very much, um, it was very much based on English constitutional practice of the day. 
but it has a sufficient degree of abstraction to speak to all of you, whether or not you're English, whether or not English is your first language. But John Locke was never very popular in England. John Locke was the taste of a small minority of intellectuals, by far the more influential writers in the late 17th and early 18th centuries were people like Albert Sidney. And if you read Albert Sidney's discourses on civil government, there will be nothing much in it you. There's precious little in there for me. This was far more powerful stuff at the time of that. What kept England free can be summed up in the Latin phrase first expressed in the 13th century and last heard in the 19th century. Legate on the inodimus mutari. We do not want the laws of England to be changed. In the 17th century, there arose the idea in people's minds of an ancient and immemorial constitution. This was carried to what we would often consider to be absurd lengths in the legal argument over the validity of Charles I's ship money or his legal taxation in the 1620s, counsel on both sides solemnly raised precedents from the reign of King Edward a thousand years before. There was an assumption in most people's minds that the Parliament which deposed Richard II in 1399 was exactly the same in its forms procedure as the Parliament which met in 1641. People might wear different clothes, but everything was unchanged. Later on, this idea of an ancient and immemorial constitution was attached to the idea of change. You'll read this in uh, Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, published in 1764, that there had at one time been this wonderfully perfect, liberal English constitution which had been disrupted by the Norman invasion, uh, and the previous 600 years had been a time of struggle to get, to get back our ancient fundamental liberties. But the idea was that the Constitution had not changed. If it had changed in the past, it was the worst, and any change now should simply be towards recovering that earlier effect. Not true, or rather not strictly true, but the point is people believed it. And the fact that the Constitution was believed not to have changed in the past was an excellent reason for declaring the Constitution should not change now or in the future. The system was legitimized by the fact, or the belief in, its legitimacy. So the legitimacy was based on its immemoriality. It had always been so, therefore it should always be so. Now, if you look at England in the 18th century with the eye of an outsider, you will see rather less than a libertarian society. You will see many good features, but then as well on some bad features. Let us look at the law. The criminal law was a mass of a, a, a mass of injustice. You could be hanged for well over a hundred felonies. If you were tried for those felonies, you were not allowed legal representation. Oh, if there was a question of law raised, counsel was then assigned to you. But on pure matter of facts, you were expected to defend yourself. On the other hand, if there was the slightest defect in the procedure, the prosecution case will be thrown out if there was a spelling mistake in the indictment or a miscon. The whole proceedings were held null and void. But it meant that criminal trials were often rather like the toss of the coin. Heads, you hang, tails, you go free, guilt, innocence, or something else. If you turn to the civil law, that again was a mess of absurdity. There were three common law courts the Court of King's Bench, the Court of Common Pleas, the Court of Exchequer, and there was the Court of Chancery in Fourth an entirely different system of law known as equity. 
if you wanted to, if you wanted to start a law case, you would, you might need to file proceedings in two or maybe three different courts, which all proceeded at different speeds and in different ways, and you might lose in one court and lose in the other. Everything was slow. Everything was expensive. Many things were deeply uncertain. England was not a libertarian society as we would regard it. Yet England was a free country. There's no doubt about it. It was a free country. The state did not intervene in many areas of life. We were left alone to live very largely as we pleased, and of course the taxes were much lower. Now, let me continue with the good points about this system. Because everybody believed that the Constitution was legitimized by its antiquity, and because everybody was terrified to raise a single finger against this magnificent structure known as the English Constitution, it meant that the authorities were as tightly circumscribed in their behavior as if we had had the sort of Constitution the American founding fathers thought they had given to the United States. Let me give you two cases, two examples. In 1765, the government got a general warrant out to search a printer. Now, the, the, the common law said that, the common law said, still says, that if you want to search for evidence of a crime. You must get a warrant for a magistrate, and you must, you must specify the place to be searched, and you must specify what you are searching for. And if there is any defect in the execution of that warrant, the officers involved are liable to criminal or civil prosecution. A, a general warrant, however, was rather different. It allowed the authorities to go on what in England is called a fishing expedition. There is no address named in the warrant, and there is no specification of the goods to be seized. Um, it is just a general warrant. It allows you to go and do somebody over and look for evidence of a crime which is not specified. Now, now this procedure come in in the Licensing Act of 1661. The Licensing Act had expired in, I think, 1694. But the procedure for getting a general warrant um, continued because nobody had noticed that it was no longer legal. And they were not used very extensively. <clears throat> but in 1764, the, one of the Secretaries of State got a general warrant to search the premises of a Mr. Carrington, a printer, to see if he was publishing seditious literature. Mr. Entick refused to allow the magistrates and the, uh, and the officers to enter. And he took legal action against the Secretary of State. And it went into court. And the judge, I think it was just Lord Chief Justice Cameron, listened to the arguments on both sides. And the government lawyers got up and said, well, you know, there may be perhaps some ambiguity as to these warrants, but they're required. I mean, how on earth are you supposed to govern a country with all these people running around publishing sedition? And the judge slapped him down, saying, I'm very sorry, but reason of state is no defense in a court of law. And the government lost. And the Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Harrington, had to pay damages. I think how much it was, it was either 1,000 or 10,000 pounds doesn't matter. This is a lot of money by today's standards. And from that time, it was generally believed, generally accepted, that general warrants were illegal in each law. And the government did not rush through an act of parliament shortly afterwards allowing general warrants. The courts had pronounced these warrants were unconstitutional, therefore they could not be used. Now that was something that happened in a time of moderate political excitement. Let me move to another example. 1793, year two of the French Republic, the world's first modern totalitarian killing machine 
was chewing its way through France. The king had had his head cut off. The queen had had her head cut off. Thousands of people were being put to death with the semblance, not even the semblance, of a trial. France was turning upside down. A great cataract of blood everywhere. And there were radicals in England who wanted the same for us. Some of these people were simply misguided, these idiots. Some of them wanted a reign of terror in England. Oh, there was a mess, there was a huge moral panic. There were people running around saying that Tom Paine was fomenting civil war and rebellion. There were people who claimed that little extracts from the rights of man by Tom Paine were being printed on sweet wraps and given to children. I mean, you've probably heard all this stuff many times before in other contexts. There is a problem. The government must do something about it. But even when you put aside the exaggeration and the moral panic. There was a conspiracy in England. There was a large and well-coordinated radical movement which wanted to do to England what had been done to France. And so in September 1793, the government arrested 12 men, whom it said were the leaders of the English radical movement. A couple of them were people like John Phil, um, a troublemaker, and he would he would probably have loved to stick a cap of liberty on his head and wander around and having people sent off to the guillotine. Uh, but most of the people arrested, people like John Paul too, old-fashioned radical, friend of Dr. Johnson, uh, believed in parliamentary reform. Uh, Thomas Hardy, um, a well-intentioned, not entirely intelligent uh, dude believed that you know, the working man should get a fair deal and there should be a bit of parliamentary reform and a few tax cuts, that sort of thing. But these men came to trial at a time of immense moral panic. I mean, you can stand on, you, you can stand on the cliffs of Dover and you can look across the channel and today, if the wind's in the right direction, you can almost smell garlic. <laughs> 200 years ago, you can look across the channel and you can almost see the guillotine rising and falling and people were frightened, and with good reason. And these men were brought to trial, and they were given a due process of law. The first trial came on that of John Paul II. The defense counsel, Thomas Erskine, a great advocate, he called the prime minister to give evidence to the defense. He subpoenaed the prime minister, forced him to leave his house in Downing Street, where he was trying to conduct a war with France, and to walk into the guild hall where the trial was taking place in London and to give evidence about how he had cooperated with John Paul II nine years earlier in a failed attempt at parliamentary reform. Erskine's speech to the defence went on, I think, for seven hours. At the end of that time, the jury brought its verdict not guilty. John Paul II. John Paul II released, wouldn't be tried twice for the same offence, never touched again by the authorities for the rest of his life, I think about 1814. Next trial came on, Thomas Harley, the radical boot. Erskine ripped the prosecution evidence to pieces. It was based on, oh, the usual stuff, agents of provocation, letters steamed open, overheard remarks, hearsay evidence, um, you can find Erskine's speech in the state trials. It goes on and on and on. Another mammoth effort. Well, the three can say, at the end of the trial, the jury came back, not guilty, Thomas Hardy released. The third trial came on John Selwall. Now, here's the trouble, maker. You know? If he'd been brought on first, the government might have got a prediction, but they lost heart. John Selwall came into court and the prosecution stood up and said, we're withdrawing all the charges. And Thelwall was rather upset. He said to the judge, oh, but I want my day in court. I want to speak, I want a speech to give. I won't take up 45 minutes. <laughs> and the judge threw him out into the street. And that was the end of the treason trials of 1793. And there was no repetition for that. Oh, yes, the government sharpened up the laws against seditious libel. And if you were an anti-establishment journalist, 
you might find your spy wrong, you might find yourself done over now and again. But the English Constitution, imperfect as it was, had sufficient legitimacy <coughs> with the majority of people to let us prevent the horrors of England of the French Revolution. It also had sufficient legitimacy with the ruling class, with the powers that be, to prevent in England the sort of horrors that you see in operas like Fidelia or Tosca. This sort of nasty, reactionary, police state, <coughs> spying on people, torturing people, putting people to death without trial. We had none of that. Yes, we had an absurd and chaotic legal system. Yes, there was much questionable about English constitutional law and practice. But the belief that this was an ancient and immemorial constitution preserved us from anything like the French Revolution or anything like the reaction in most other European countries against the French Revolution. The, the constitution was destabilized in the 1830s. The reform of Parliament was well intentioned and perhaps was inevitable. The legal reforms of the years between 1830 and about 1880 were very good. Um, the old legal system was very hard to defend. But you see, it was changed. <coughs> and it was often rapid change. The 19th century reformers did their best to disguise the fact that it was changed. The way you maintain the fiction of an ancient and immemorial order of things is by allowing most institutions and most customs and most traditions to continue uninterfered with, uninterrupted. Customs die as they become useless and new customs emerge. And every so often there are changes. But these changes take place against an apparently unshifting background. It is possible to say the Constitution is ancient and unchanging. We're going to make this little tiny change. You make it, there's an all argument over it, people forget about it. It becomes part of that background of immemoriality. And five years later, we have another change. The Constitution, as I said, was destabilized by reform. But, as lately, as, as recently as the 1970s, when I was a boy, it was still possible to believe that nothing much had changed. You see, the way in which England was governed, the customs and institutions of a national life had not changed that much, or seemed to most people not to have changed that much. When I learned about English politics of the 1670s, 80s, and 90s, I really have to look up glossaries to see well, what does this title mean? What does that office mean? Um, you know, how does a you know, how does a bill proceed through Parliament? I didn't need to know that. It was history, but it was also current politics. I could use my actual everyday experience of constitutional practice in London to understand the arguments and the proceedings of 300 years earlier. <clears throat> and then the collapse came on. The English Constitution could be compared to one of those wonderful Greek temples we've been looking at for the past few days. It stood proud and unbroken for a thousand years. And then many people decided that these things were worthless. And for 200 years, fanatics and thieves chipped away at it neglected it, defaced it. But at the end of 200 years, these structures were still standing, still very largely what they had been in the past. And then the enemies found a new way of destroying those buildings. You do not attack with a front or sword. The buildings are too solidly constructed. What you do is dig the underneath them, big tunnels, light fires, so the props collapse, bring the ground down, and bang, there goes your temple. And that's what the left has been doing to my country since the 1960s 
for the 1970s. I, I will go to argue where it started. If in 1960 you had brought in, if in 1960 the government had brought in a bill called the Abolition of the Common Law Bill, they would be thrown out and be laughed at. They can't do that. Liberty in England does not depend on a written constitution as in the United States. It depends instead on a web of institutions and assumptions. You cannot abolish trouble by jury. It's always existed. We can't do that. We've had a great hundred years. Oh no, you can't send to the press. We don't have that in England. Oh no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. There's no constitutional provision that says you can't. You just can't do it because it is not part of our way. And so what you do is you abolish our way. You do it with small but repeated cuts at the margin. Who will defend the English system of weights and measures? Thoroughly irrational. Twelve inches to the foot, three feet to the yard, 1,760 yards to the mile, 5,280 feet to the mile, um, 360,000 inches to the mile, I think, if you will take a view. Not very rational, is it? And I won't even describe the way in which we weigh things. So, let your place of the metric system. Yeah, okay, it's an improvement. What about the old English currency? 240 pence per pound divided into 20 shillings of 12 pence. Yeah? Not very sensible, is it? Let's replace it. Let's decimalize it. Let's have 100 pence per pound. The English county system, 48 counties, um, which do not necessarily correspond with the modern distribution of population. So let's sweep it away. Let's divide Yorkshire into three counties. Let's partition Sussex. Let's abolish Middlesex and Trotshire. What about the English legal procedure? Well, okay, let's, uh, let's get rid of all this old-fashioned language of writs and affidavits and plaintiffs. Let's replace it with claim forms, statements of truth, claims. Surely only a crank, surely only a nutcase will object to these improvements, 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 <laughs> modernization, that's what they call it. The problem is that after 40 years of this, this web of customs and institutions on which ability depended had been worn very thin. It does still work. It does still work. During the past six months, I've been doing a lot of radio and television work defending the right of an organization called the British National Party to exist and to pursue it. Uh, the British National Party is said to be a National Socialist movement. There are some National Socialists in it, but I think it's more accurate to describe nowadays as a white nationalist movement. The point is, it doesn't matter who they are. I mean, they have a picture of a guest chamber on the front cover of their literature. It doesn't matter. They have a right to say what they are. Now, at first, when I used to go on and defend their right to speak, and to publish, and to organize, I tried making abstract arguments about people's right to express any opinion they like on matters of public, um, on matters of public policy. This didn't seem to, it, it didn't seem to get much resonance with people. And so I rapidly switched to this argument. Well, you know, these men are being prosecuted under laws that didn't exist when I was a boy. When I was born, you know, until when I was a boy, you could say anything you liked in this country on matters of public policy. Anything at all. Why can't we go back to that? These laws are illegitimate. And you know, the enemy has no answer to that. They are, they, they sit by silent and embarrassed as people call it one after the other and say, well, I mean, I don't agree with the British National Party, and I think the British is a thoroughly bad man, but so uh, Sean Bryant, uh, you know, you, these laws are monstrous. You can't do this. It still works. It still works. But for how much longer? Um, we are facing not a full front of assault in the moment, but it is becoming that. But we are facing a series of side 
are stories. You attack the minor things of our national life. You tear up that web of customs and institutions that preserve freedom. And, and when you've done that, you have things like trial by jury, the presumption of innocence, the right against self-incrimination, the right to freedom of speech, etc. You have those things standing alone. They were never meant to stand alone. They were meant to be supported by a vast wing of other less important things. But they stand alone and they go not over one to time. And so, I suppose the lesson of what I'm saying today is this. We should try not to be arrogant about the power of abstract ideas. They sway our minds, so they don't sway the minds of the masses. We should respect the customs and institutions of ordinary people, so far as we can. These may not be immediately conducive to a free society, but believe me, from my experience in England, once you get rid of things which are not immediately conducive to freedom, things like the English system of weights and measures, you will see that they did have a certain supporting role. And if we ever do win the matter of ideas, in order to get a complete and overpowered thing, so that the corrupt intellectuals and the rest of business interests and other no, vested interest groups do not make a recovery. We need to ensure that our ideas are as far as possible embodied, not just in a written document, which American experience suggests is by no means enough. We must make sure that our ideas are embodied in the practices and beliefs and customs and traditions of daily life. Ideas are important. Ideas, in a sense, change the world. But if you want to influence ordinary people, you don't just throw a couple of volumes of Rothbard or Neves or Hopper at them. They're not ready for that. They're good. And I'm not criticizing the positives. They're just not up to it in the same way as I'm not up to deciding what is the best policy. We need to be rather more sophisticated in our defense, in our attack, and if we ever get it, in our triumph. Now, one last point. Um, the English conservative movement is so ill-funded and so ill-organized that we have to print and buy our own books. And this is one of them, it's a couple of years old. Um, I meant to sell out 50 copies. Unfortunately, I sold out 3,000 because people keep ordering the thing. I keep promising to revise it and double the size of it. But um, I, did, I did throw some together before I came out. Some of them are very badly bound. And my wife looked at them and said, you're going to take loads, are you? And I said, oh, yes. <laughs> um, I normally sell them at the gross price of £18.99. I put them up to that price to stop them from buying them because it's too much trouble to print and buy them. <laughs> you can have them for, um, uh, <coughs> you can have them for, what is 10 Turkish euro? Is that a reasonable price? That's like 4 pounds. Yeah. yeah, 10 euro. <laughs> and I've had my half hour. Thank you very much for your indulgence.